Welcome to Dare to Dream. This is Debbie Dashinger, and I'm the host of the Dare to Dream show. Today, we're going to be featuring a deep dive into the mysteries of knowledge and exploration with Brad Olson, author, speaker, pioneer of the esoteric. Dare to Dream podcast won the COVR Award for Best Radio and Podcast Show. Welp Magazine lists Dare to Dream with Debbie Dashinger as one of the top 20 best podcasts to listen to, nominated for Two People's Choice Podcast Awards, a Webby Award, and a high-ranking podcast in Apple Podcasts. This show is sponsored by Dr. Dane here and Access Consciousness. They do energy work out in the world. If you would like to take one of their classes or become a facilitator, go to Dr. Dane, D-A-I-N, here, H-E-E-R dot com. I'm Debbie Dashinger. I'm a media visibility expert. I'm a book writing coach to those of you who have an idea and want to finish your book from inception to publish. I also run a company that takes your book to a guaranteed international bestselling status. And finally, I show you how to be interviewed on radio and podcast and get massive results, the entire system. If you would like to start light with me and go learn exactly how to do this, you're a spiritual messenger, you came here with great purpose at this time. I have some gifts for you, templates, videos that will teach you how to do this so you can get started. Go to debbiedashinger.com slash gift. It's D-E-B-B-I-D-A-C-H-I-N-G-E-R.com slash gift and start learning how to get podcast and media bookings now. My guest, Brad Olson, is a captivating author and speaker renowned for his 10 books, including the acclaimed esoteric series, Modern Esoteric, Future Esoteric, and the latest release, Beyond Esoteric. With awards in writing, publishing, and event production, Brad's enlightening talks have graced major platforms like Contact in the Desert. Conscious Life Expo, and Mount Shasta Summer Conference. He's been featured on numerous radio and TV programs, including Coast to Coast, Ancient Aliens, and America Unearthed. With a passion for exploration, Brad has voyaged to all seven continents, even reaching Antarctica by sailboat. He's also a co-founder of San Francisco's How Weird Street Fair. Alongside his esoteric writing, he pioneers alternative journalism, public speaking, illustration, and photography. You can learn more about him at bradolsen.com. And with that, I welcome Brad to the Dare to Dream show. It is so amazing to have you here. How weird. (laughs) <laughs> That's so great. <laughs> well, thanks, Debbie. Thanks for having me on Dare to Dream. And yes, I do dare to dream. And uh, maybe we'll dream together this show and all the cool things that are going on in the world and we can highlight them. Oh, that sounds amazing. I'm totally in. You know, the first thing that comes to my mind is your travel, like a man after my heart. Because that's one of my greatest desires. And I've certainly done some in my life, but I've got one of those spirits that really longs to see the country, the world. After doing seven continents, and I know some of those were extensive for you, do you still have the bug at all? Is there any place you have not been? Oh, gosh, yeah. Uh, I've only been to Egypt and Africa, so still have a whole continent there to explore. And I'd love to go back to Egypt as well. And there's still a lot of places I didn't get to see there, even spending a month there. So there's just so many places around the world. Boy, I probably will uh, spend my uh, rest of my life going to new places. But you also mentioned uh, domestically, and, and, uh, and I should point out to people that trips around North America are fantastic too. There is so much to see and do. It's an incredibly beautiful continent. Uh, we're both on the West Coast, so we know that uh, just up and down from Cabo San Lucas to Alaska is one of the most dramatic coastlines and coolest places uh, I've seen in the world. It's so true. And most people don't even know. I live I live in a suburb in Los Angeles, a little bit more suburban than LA out in the valley. When you drive up north, it's spectacular. For me, I need to pass San Francisco. I need to get out of the city. And then the higher north you get, 
it's God's country. And, you know, that, that trip alone to go all the way to the Oregon border, all, all the way to Vancouver is really worthwhile. Spectacular. And right now is the time to do it. This is road trip season out West here. Uh, e even into, uh, as you know, our Indian summer in October is really gorgeous out in California. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're West. very fortunate. That's such a, a new, I'm originally from New York. That's a big New York term, an Indian summer, which for folks who don't know, that just means the weather extends sometimes into October for sure here. And we keep those that summer heat going so we can have more of that. So speaking of travels, I know that you explored ancient Peru. And yeah. I'm I just finished a sh six-month shaman class, which was connected to the lineage of the Incas and I'm the, the Keros, and I'm deeply into it. So I'm curious about that. When you were there in Peru, were there lost technologies that you discovered? and forgotten civilizations that you unearthed? Oh yeah, well, to give a short answer, absolutely right. I, I was there with Nassim Harriman, who's a real cutting edge new physicist, and Brian Forrester, who knew all about the elongated skulls and the megalithic complexes mm -hmm. and how many of these giant with the elongated heads were buried right alongside many of these megalithic sites suggesting that they were the builders. And Peru, especially in the Sacred Valley, as it's called, where Cusco is and offshoot is Machu Picchu, has the most amount of megaliths per square mile than any other place on earth. There's just so many that the, you, you drive by in the bus or I, I bought a car, I bought a Ford Expedition that I was camping in my partner at the time, and we were just driving by. There's so many, you just don't even notice them. If, if you took one of those minor megalithic sites and say, put it in North America, it'd be the biggest national park in our country. But wow. down there, there's just so many and, and terraces up uh, sides of the, the hills where they're, they've been wild and not tended for many years. You just see that this had once been a very high civilization in this particular area called the Sacred Valley of Peru. And what did you take away from it? Did something change for you while you were there? Did you have an experience or a process that really altered you? Oh, yes. And just to uh, backtrack to your previous question about uh, lost technology, that yeah. that's really what impressed me, mm -hmm. that there was also clear evidence of the moving of these megaliths, some of which weigh 70 tons at the site of Sacsayhuaman, which is just above Cuzco in this particular area of Peru, that even cranes, modern cranes today would struggle to get them from the quarry to this site. And then the way that they are so perfectly fitted together that we started talking about ways that matter can be manipulated. And one of those that Nassim Harriman was talking about is this process called cold plasma. And it basically renders hard materials such as stone into a softened stage. And he was proposing that the ancients who build many of these megalithic sites had this ability to soften the stone. And that's why you get these such precise fits with all these very odd angles that would be very, very difficult to chisel and then put into place and have such a precise fit. The other lost technology that we discussed was the movement of these megaliths. As I said, even modern cranes today would struggle to move some of these larger stones. So we were looking into the possibility that the, these ancients had a form of technology described as auditive levitation. And that's using sound and vibration to also render an object weightless. So just as an example that I often talk about in my presentations at conferences, and I do a whole presentation on the mysteries of South America, think about how a opera singer can shatter a wine glass with just her voice. That's only sound and 
and uh, vibration that does that. It, there's no uh, projectile hitting that wine glass. It's just her voice. So this is a very strong possibility that a lot of the megalithic sites, not just in Peru, Bolivia, but around the world, the blocks were moved using this technique of auditive levitation. How do you imagine that? How do you envision that? I completely understand what you're saying. And I really appreciate the fact that sound frequency and vibration has been around for a long time and has been used way more advanced in the past. So how do you envision that they actually were able to use it? Was it something that came from their mouths, an instrument? Was there a technology that emitted the frequency that made it into the cold plasma, it took hard into soft, and then also was able to move it? Any clue? Sure. Well, a really good clue is a location in Southern Florida, in Homestead, Florida, called the Coral Castle. And I visited that location, built single-handedly by one slight figure named Ed Lee Scalian. And he single-handedly built this whole megalithic complex called the Coral Castle. Some of the stones there weigh 33 tons. Other tall stones that he placed into the ground as a, a form of using as a uh, sundial are 20 feet tall. Now, how does one guy alone build such a complex? And when asked, he would only say, that he knew the secrets of how they built the Great Pyramids. And a couple of times, little kids would spy on him because he would work in the middle of the night and move these megalithic stones. And they would say that he, he would hold these two uh, cone-shaped objects in his hand. Perhaps they were frequency devices. Perhaps they would match the resonant frequency of the block to render it weightless because the kids would say he would do this. And although many of the blocks also had uh, levees and um, pulleys and uh, cables attached to them, but he would just move them so effortlessly and put them into place while holding these cone-like objects. So there are some secrets that went to the grave with Edley Scalin, but the Coral Castle is the only modern age megalithic building in the world. The only one that was built in the 20th century. So it, it's kind of a lost art form, Debbie. And, and I think we're slowly putting the puzzle pieces back together and getting a clear idea of how these credible megalithic buildings around the world were constructed. All right. Do you have any interest in following the rabbit hole and figuring out? Are you working with anybody who can figure this out? Well, like I said, Brian Forster's in a lab, or he's in the field, and Nassim Harriman's in a laboratory, uh, and there are other people working together. And the great thing about being a speaker at all these conferences is I get to meet a lot of these people. I get to know them and, and watch their presentations and collect some of the latest information that's coming out. But this was all just revealed... Uh, five years ago when I was down in South America on my way to taking a sailboat over to Antarctica. Amazing. And while you were there, did you get to work with any shamans, any indigenous medicine people? Yep, <laughs> sure did. Got to do an ayahuasca ceremony. That was pretty incredible. In Copacabana, Bolivia, right on the shores of Lake Titicaca. Incredible lake. Just so beautiful. Highest and largest alpine lake in the world. It's so big, you can't even see across the longest section of it, which is over 100 miles. And it's a giant volcanic caldera that collapsed. And um, so it's a very deep lake as well with many islands. And on those islands are also megalithic buildings. And this was the uh, <clears throat> birthplace of the Incan people. They believed that they came out of this location on the island of the sun and then populated the south american continent with the incan people and culture yeah they're and they're amazing people too there's almost virtually no disease there i mean people die of old age but they don't have what we have here cancer and heart disease and 
being overweight and diabetes and et cetera, it just doesn't exist. And part of that is because of the plants that they ingest and the relationship they have with nature and the world and the unseen. And I, I find that culture fascinating, really incredible. So, fascinating. so great. You did ayahuasca there. <laughs> <laughs> so did there. Yeah, I threw up, but <laughs> uh, that's kind of comes with the territory. And it was with a bunch of people from our uh, travel group that went through Peru and Bolivia with uh, Brian Forster, Adam Apollo was there as well. And uh, I was one of the guest speakers. So it was, a, it was an all-star lineup and five of us were at Contact in the Desert this last June. And so we'd all see each other. It was kind of a family reunion. Everybody's in great spirit to see each other. And not too far away from Peru, well, it's in Ecuador, actually, is Vilcabamba Valley. And you mentioned longevity and, and no diseases. That location has one of the highest statistically uh, longest living age people in the world. And is that a blue zone? Why? Well, this particular area, but they found out that the water that people drink that comes out of a spring is clustered water molecules. So when looked under the microscope, they have beautiful symmetry of clustered water. And it turns out this clustered molecule in the water is very healthy, very good for the body. And it turns out it's found at a lot of other locations in the world, including Lourdes, France, which is this spontaneous healing location and when tested, the water of Lourdes, which they use for ceremony, communion, baptism, so forth, and drinking, is incredibly helpful. And it's this clustered water. So once again, here's science finally catching up to what a lot of the ancients knew or uh, were just using and, and feeling pretty good with it. Uh, Dr. Emoto out of Japan, he did a study. I cover this in my esoteric series of books, it's in Future Esoteric, where he did experiments with people who would curse the water. You're so ugly, you're terrible, you're bad water, you're polluted. And they'd look at it under a microscope and it was very chaotic that the molecules were all over the place. But then when his subjects would praise the water and say, oh, I love you, you give us life, you do so much for us. They looked at the, the exact same water flew out of the same uh, source, but the love molecules were beautiful. They were like snowflakes or perfect symmetry and all these beautiful patterns and stuff. So it just shows that the power of the mind is very powerful and we can affect the world around us with our thoughts. Oh, perfect. I love that you said that. Because, of course, as metaphysicians, we all agree with what you're saying. We're taught this. We feel the truth of this. And, okay, we create our reality. And then we're led to this undeniable and inspiring conclusion. Oh, well, if that's so, then it's actually all in my hands, right? It's Or it's all in our thoughts or beliefs. So taking that concept is the future of humanity as far as you're concerned at stake? And if so, do we hold the keys? How do we use the keys to open the door? Well, I guess to sum it up very succinctly, the two most profound words of the ancient world were written on the temple of Apollo at Delphi in Greece. And those two words are know thyself. Mm -hmm. And I think this, the, 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 the biggest, enigma since ancient times is just to know who we are and know the powers that we have. And I have also a chapter in Future Esoteric called Superhuman Abilities, which is basically all these innate abilities that we all have that we've just not been taught or trained to know how to use. But once you know about them and, and you could start exercising and working on them, then you can actually uh, start to have your own superhuman abilities. So it really comes from within and it comes from this whole saying, know thyself. And once you can start to master your own mind and body and world around you, uh, things will change for the better. 
what what are some of the gifts that you have? What are some of the gifts that not everybody's connected to, but that you are aware of in you and that you utilize? Well, uh, get to know I Brad. That, that I, yeah, <laughs> that I've that I've mastered all these uh, superhuman abilities that I write about. I'm just very fascinated with them, and, and in my own way, working on them through meditation or just practice or thoughts. I just I I like to exercise a lot. So this kind of helps keep me young and vibrant and being able to travel and do the things I like to do. Um, but also this whole notion of joie de vivre. This is a French term for the joy of living. Life. Just, just yeah. be happy with what you have and go and enjoy a, a nice meal or go watch the sunset and hang out with your friends. Last night I was on the beach in Lake Tahoe at a friend of mine was DJ and doing a static dance. And it was just so awesome, incredible watching the sunset and being around like-minded people. So little things like that can really put you in a better frame of mind. And, and you really have to be in a, a positive frame of mind for a lot of these other superhuman abilities to kick in because really you have to be up in, in the, the love, vibration, compassion, generosity with with uh yeah also yeah the, just the higher higher emotions rather than if you're down in fear and anger and hatred it's not going to work it won't work so you have to bring yourself up to these higher levels and that's where joie de vivre the joy of living comes into play yeah 100 percent. yeah i also find that joy and surrender go very nicely, mm -hmm. you know, this detachment about, ah, this is what's happening. Isn't that perfect? You know, and something more divine will come in just to allow a flow. It seems to be a great magnetizer for more wonderful things to come in. Keep filling up that cup. It's a good reminder. Um, was there a trip, Brad, where you experienced a site somewhere in the world where ancient peoples once gathered to perform sacred rituals and ceremonies where they were worshiping various gods they were achieving spiritual enlightenment is there a story you have about that oh yeah sure well there are many locations that i went to that fit that bill but i'd say the most profound was the great pyramid of egypt mm -hmm. where i uh I did a couple things you're not supposed to do, Debbie. So I'm just going to chalk this up as uh, <laughs> youthful indiscretions. Uh, <laughs> I climbed to the top of the Great Pyramid was one of them. You're not supposed to do that. And How did you do that? Well, <laughs> so I know that there's a, uh, that that the eyes are are temporarily blinded when when it goes from complete darkness to bright light. And so I went up on the Giza Plateau on a full moon night. Um, mm. So there was enough of that light, but they were doing the sound and light show. Oh. And I, with the partner I was with, I said, I really want to climb the Great Pyramid. I got to try. And so I walked around the, the base of it. And at one point I tried and got shouted down and they shamed me. What are you doing? Didn't you see the signs? Get out of here. Like, All right. Sorry. <laughs> Started walking around and then they stopped following me and they thought I was just beeline it back down the way I came in and I looked around and there's no one watching me directly so I went back up to the pyramid and right at that moment the sound and light show which had been bright light on the great pyramid the light went off and I was like this is my opportunity and I just started scrambling up the the blocks and they're about as big as a uh, washing machine and I'm a real tall guy with long legs so it wasn't a problem for me to go one to one to one to one. And then so about one third of the way up, the lights came on again. And I just kind of <laughs> tucked away in one of the shadows and didn't hear anybody shouting me down. And then lights went off again and I made it up two thirds of the way. And then after the <laughs> oh time, I made it to the top. Yeah, it was incredible. And I'll never forget it because I saw a little mouse up there. I'm thinking, well, how the heck did this thing get up there? He just kind of ran around. So I spent about a half hour up there. It's really beautiful, incredible uh, to see the darkness of the Sahara Desert to the west and then the lights of Cairo and uh, along the Nile River. So um, that would that put me in a, in a good position. And then when I toured inside the Great Pyramid, the other thing I wasn't supposed to do was lay down in the uh, sarcophagus in the King's Chamber. Uh -huh. 
And that was the actual initiation point. I'm not sure if you saw the uh, Forbidden Archaeology panel at Contact in the Desert, but here I am sitting right next to Graham Hancock on one side and Linda Moulton Howe on the other. Uh, and the conversation mm. turned to the Great Pyramid. And, um, and I said, yeah, I did this. I laid down in the sarcophagus, but made note that among the first archaeologists to examine the Great Pyramid found this white powdery substance near the sarcophagus in the king's chamber. And I think it was the, uh, the archaeologist um, Petrie or perhaps someone else. He had the foresight to package it up and send it back to the UK. And then some years later, they tested it, this white powder that was found at, inside the Great Pyramid, found out that it had come from ingesting monatomic gold. Oh, and came oh, out through the sweat glands. And but the monatomic gold trace elements were still there. And that was what the white powder was. So they're using monatomic gold. And I have a whole chapter in my book, Beyond Esoteric, about how you can use this and how the ancients used this to take them to the next level of some of these deeper meditations and you can basically leave your body after a while uh, to be able to remote view or astral travel. This is fascinating. So I've been on the periphery of this gold, which is a white powder and I purchased some and I think I started playing with it. And I, yeah. Just stopped. You know, you have so many healthy things around, but more right. recently, I would say the last three months, every time I've got this amazing healthy smoothie I make. And now every time I make it along with all the incredible ingredients in there, I have been sprinkling the monatomic gold in it. Uh -oh. And so tell us more about what we can do with this, how it assists the body. And it sounds like also spiritually how we can play with it. Yeah, I've, I've tried some too. I don't think I got to that state where I could consciously leave my body with it, but perhaps you have to do it more frequently and um, more rigorous, different kind of training that go along with it that the ancients once used. I should just point out that um, whenever someone from the Western world, especially in the time of the ancient Greeks, such as the historian Solon went to Egypt. He went through the initiation program. And I, I think he probably would have used some of this monatomic gold because he was absolutely changed when he came back out. Wow. In more recent times, you have people like Napoleon who spent the night in the Great Pyramid, the King's Chamber, as well as Aleister Crowley, who said he communicated with gray aliens while in there. Mm. So just, just the fact that you're inside this pyramid, which basically the literal meaning of pyramid means fire within. And you can look on YouTube and see videos of just the, the fact of creating a four-sided pyramid focuses energy from within through the top. So the, the, clearly the ancients knew that too. But in my uh, dabbling with the uh, monatomic gold, I had a friend who got some for me you don't get high you don't you don't feel anything in any way there's no psychoactive properties to it at all it's just kind of drinking <laughs> putting it in a drink or if you tasted it it's, it's not appealing it's just kind of like uh dirt or something mm -hmm. it, it kind of is because this monatomic gold what that means is mono one atom so it's very very small and it's so small that it can sometimes even transit to air, that it's not always a solid because it's just one atom, monatomic gold. So it's a new kind of gold. And it's, it's actually white in color. It's not the yellowish gold that we're familiar with. And so it's a whole different kind of substance. And I really would like to re- uh, examine it and and try it some more and and do it properly, perhaps in ceremonial fashion, and and see what that uh, does and what that feels like. Let me know. <laughs> I, I might join you. That sounds amazing. Wow. 
And is there anything else you did while in Egypt that only we should know about and never tell any of the authorities in Egypt? <laughs> well, that was back in 1993. So I think I got the statue of limitations behind <laughs> me. But well, another cool thing I did was I rode a horse from the Giza Plateau down to Saqqara, oh. which is step pyramid about 25, 30 miles away. It was a pretty good mm -hmm. hike. Mm -hmm. We were both pretty uh, saddled uh warren when we got back from that trip but i tell you along the way debbie we we saw uh all kind of different pyramids uh including the bent pyramid which is just clearly built in an inferior fashion you look back and you look at the great pyramids and they're just so symmetrical they're so perfectly formed and then other it's pyramids Fibonacci, the way, isn't it they yeah, use Fib right. well <laughs> what we know is Fibonacci, but yes. Okay. There are other pyramids that are just rubble piles. So it occurred to me, how is it that uh, these pyramids like Saqqara are, um, well, that one's older, but some of these ones like the bent pyramid are newer. How did they lose that precise building technique of the great pyramids and created these other ones later on that are just rubble piles. It should go the other way around. It should be that you start out with archaic versions of a pyramid and then you, your apex of knowledge, you're building the great pyramids, right? But it didn't work that way in Egypt, nor with all the megalithic buildings. So the more, the farther back you go and the, the, the classic example is the Osirion in Abydos, Egypt, a massive megalithic temple. Mm. That's the one that has what look like uh, flying machines or submarines or helicopters in the hieroglyphic carved into the stone, as well as the flower of life, that motif with the 64 petals, the sacred geometry, not carved, not painted, but laser etched into the stone using some kind of high technology to put it in there and i've got an image of it and a description in my book modern esoteric that goes into a lot more detail of abydos and some of these but that being one of the oldest temples in egypt so once again the older you are in egypt the more megalithic and the more precise in the building and the more mysteries as far as the carvings go so egypt is, is really a major enigma on this planet where they got the technology so early on mm. i believe it's really an offshoot of atlantis and it's called the osiris empire those were the survivors of the last high culture on the earth before some big earth changes we've heard about it with noah and the flood but uh modern geographer and geologist would describe it as a pole shift when the continents actually move plate tectonics and this is a world changing event which completely redraws the map of the continents some rise some fall and then others change their characteristics altogether so this happens more frequently on planet earth than a lot of people are aware of only every 20 or 30,000 years mm -hmm. so we could be <laughs> getting ready for another one the famous oceanographer Jacques Cousteau he was doing scuba diving in the Yucatan, going down those uh, cenotes, those uh, those deep water chambers, and sometimes even going down in a submersible, like in a mini sub, and discovering way, way deep in some of these underwater caves that the stalactites and the stalagmites were at a 45 degree angle. Mm. They can only form when they're in cave form and then they are straight up and straight down, right? Mm. It's dripping water. It's the minerals that collects that creates that. So when Jacques Cousteau found these at a 45 degree angle, he said, this is evidence that there was pulse shift and that it shifted the ground. So created that 45 degree angle mm. and flooded those caves that uh, would have normally had to have been dry to create the stalactites and stalagmites. So yeah. there's a lot of evidence around the world that, that this does occur fairly recently. I followed, you mentioned Graham Hancock, and I followed his series that was recently on Netflix, which was, I thought, amazing. And I love that he bucks up against conventional archaeology and 
you know, he's a voice for now. And he shows us through going to these sacred ancient sites over and over again, that this rebirth, if you will, of the planet and of societies and countries has happened over and over again. And which countries they happen in and what goes underwater and what comes up out of water and, you know, just incredible stuff. It basically rewrites history as we've been taught and shows us there was something very different going on all this time. Mm -hmm. Worthy, really worthy conversation. And I know you mentioned, Brad, that you love ex exercise. You've traveled a lot. Uh, you know, you do things to keep yourself young. And clearly, if you've done Aya, you know, you're an open guy, right? An open-minded guy. So what about extreme adventures? Have you had anything in particular that is outside of Egypt that was uh, dangerous, that was really extreme that you were successful at and challenged by? Yeah. It's funny you you use that term because I did two books called Extreme Adventures, Northern California and Hawaii. I lived in actually I lived in Lahaina, the city that got burned for seven mm -hmm. months. Yes. And did a whole bunch of adventures throughout the islands. Yeah, it's so sad. But also in Northern California, where I lived for about 30 years. Uh mountain climbing, been to the top of the some of the biggest mountains out west here and um, big time skier every winter get a ski pass and so in the the off season as I call summer I'm always training and exercising for ski season because it's really a sport of stamina mm -hmm. uh, it still is involved of course but you got to be in good shape to really enjoy say a good powder skiing day um, and yeah, when you're knee deep and it's the best conditions and you know how to do it, I tell you, it's, it's like dancing on clouds. It's just one of the, the greatest experiences you can have in a sport. Are there, um, is there anything about the planet's history that really reflects what's happening currently? Any events about this subject? that is coming up yet again, or influencing yet again, what is happening today? Hmm. Well, a lot of people don't know that there's a new Hawaiian island being formed to the south of the big island in Hawaii. It's called the Low High Seamount. So someday that's going to rise above the surface. But I know you could take a, a boat trip out there and Oftentimes the, the bubbles are coming up from an underwater uh, eruption, just like on the southern part of the Big Island, you can go to Kilauea Crater and, and actually see a live volcano. It's pretty amazing. In fact, there this was- This is something that is literally, this is the ocean. This is a, a landmass that is literally, the bubbles are because it is slowly making its way up. And is that because the ocean is- uh, Although I thought the ocean was getting higher with the heat on the planet. What's happening there? It's not really. I, I was just living in uh, Santa Cruz where the famous beach boardwalk is. And it's, it's, there's it's, ocean levels exactly the same. Hmm. Uh, what's going on in Hawaii, they call it the hot spot. It's one particular area in the middle of the North Pacific that is always erupting. And as the plates, the tectonic plates move, that takes the Hawaiian islands out on that trajectory. And even beyond mm -hmm. Kauai and uh, Ni'ihau, the oldest of the eight Hawaiian islands, well, there's a whole string of islands that keep going on and on and on, all the way out to Midway, about a thousand miles away. Those were all ancient Hawaiian islands at one point, because this hot spot keeps kicking up the, the lava flow and... Uh, continues to create new islands like the low high seamount which will be a future hawaiian island and let's see i, I think i'm going to sway away for just a moment from the travel because i love all of that um but let's get a tie in here because i also really love ufo conversations and I know if you're in contact in the desert, you're a super, super open guy. And if you're friends with Adam Apollo and all these other people, I know you speak the language. Is there any new UFO intel 
Um, I'm going to start there because I have so many questions around that. But is there new that we don't know yet? I'm always looking for the cutting edge, for the deep, for the unknown yet that you're privy to. Oh, gosh, Debbie, it's coming out in uh, a pretty steady stream. Remember, we would always say that disclosure was just like a little drip, drip, drip. No, it's it's flowing pretty good. But I have to wonder if there might be some ulterior motives to be releasing all this. So let's just go back a little ways. Two, three years ago, we got the TikTok video, the Pentagon admitting they're tracking UFOs, they're watching them. Uh, they're still very vague. We don't really know what they are, but they travel at incredible speeds. They utilize a technology that we don't have. All the way up to this year, Debbie, then you have Lester Holt on NBC Nightly News in May reporting to, on the mainstream media that there's a mothership in our solar system. It's just hanging out there by uh, Jupiter and uh, the Pentagon says they're watching it. Well, how isn't this the biggest news story in the world? Why aren't we still talking about it? Why aren't we zooming in on that mothership and getting some information about it and telling the people of Earth? It's always like a one and done. They'll report on something just absolutely fantastic and then be done with it. So then you get a lot of these home videos of, of Vegas where people are seeing uh, aliens in their backyard. And then the, the most recent one is down in Peru a few weeks ago where a very, very remote area in the Amazon jungle um, that these tall gray white beings that they call the face peelers that they had abducted and mutilated people of the tribe. And so a girl got taken and she told the men, she somehow escaped and said, they're out there, the face peelers, go get them. And they went with their guns and they're filming and I, it's pretty dramatic stuff, but uh, it's interesting that the mainstream media is picking up on these stories and you think, well, why now? You've had 75 years to tell the truth since Roswell. <laughs> why all of a sudden that, that you're going to start reporting on this stuff? And I, I think there happens to be some kind of ulterior motive, and that is this whole notion of a fake alien invasion that this... This Project Bluebeam, which has been on the drawing board for decades, even Werner von Braun, one of the Nazi paperclip scientists that got brought over here after World War II, told his assistant, Carol Rosen, that the final play before a new world order, a global government, global currency, even a one world religion, and all that stuff is starting to come out right now, Debbie. And it just makes me think that the media reporting on this now is predictive programming, that they're putting it into people's minds. They're desensitizing the people so that if they did do this, this fake alien invasion, like Werner von Braun said, it's fake and it'll always be fake. And you got to tell people that, uh, that they're going to make this play someday. And there was also a CIA agent way back in the late 1980s. I, I wish I would save that video or remember this guy's name, but at the end, he's in a playground. If you saw it, you'd probably remember it. And he's like, I wish I could tell all these little kids the future that they have planned coming for them. They don't know what's going on. But he predicted Project Bluebeam in 2024. So that's only a couple months away. And it seems like everything that's going on in the world right now is also a setup for this fake alien invasion, anything pertaining to UFO disclosure, okay. uh, especially as it comes through the MSM. Huge, huge. So uh, is it your contention that the fake alien invasion is so that advanced technology can be revealed? What are the details on this? That's interesting you bring that up because sometimes I'll uh, be a moderator on panels. In fact, I'll be in Las Vegas in a couple of weeks at the alien event. And I'm a panel moderator with super soldiers, transhumanism, and, and other things. And one, one time I was uh, on a panel with super soldiers and Captain Randy Kramer was on there. Yep. And the Knowing conversation well. went to uh, Project Bluebeam. Mm -hmm. And Randy Kramer said he is the official spokesman for the military who is advocating Project Bluebeam. 
So I said, Randy, how could you possibly advocate this? this is going to be collateral damage or loss of life? Uh, he said, but we have so much technology now that has been gleaned through backward engineering. They don't know how to release it to the general public. So he's saying they want Project Bluebeam so America could show off all this hardware and go in and save the day and, mm -hmm. and kill off these invading mm -hmm. aliens. Well, who's the, who's the invading aliens? What's that all about? And he said it would be the insectoids. He oh. said that they have volunteered for this because they're all of a hive mind and they can actually mm -hmm. rapidly clone and reproduce themselves. Mm -hmm. So they don't look at the sacredness of life, I guess is a way to say it, the same way that you and I do. Mm -hmm. They just like, oh yeah, if, if we get blown up in a fake alien invasion kind of scenario, we'll just be reborn again through the hive and it's not a big deal. So so if if we roll out all our high technology, if we have this war with the insectoids and oh, it'd be very realistic. Some of them will be actual battles and blowing up ships and let's say we're all in our backyard watching it and a, a, a big reptoid arm like <laughs> comes flying down and lands in, in the backyard. Well, that would be pretty darn realistic. That would get <laughs> most people to believe it's more than a fake alien invasion that it's actually quite real. But wow. there would be the, the motivation behind it to um, initiate a lot of this these globalist agendas. And I do outline quite a few of them in my esoteric series of books, especially in Beyond Esoteric, the newest one in a section called neo-fascism the whole uh, first section outlining the the plans of these globalists to uh take over the planet and enslave us all in a transhumanistic world and oh there's just so many vectors that come into play we could spend a whole show talking about it but uh maybe better people to check out the book if they're interested in this subject yeah so in light of all of that assuming that is all absolutely accurate, then how would we distinguish the fake aliens and technology, not technology, but how would we distinguish the fake from the genuine, the real UFOs, the real extraterrestrials, in fact, the benevolent extraterrestrials, because we do have star nations, star brothers and sisters who love us, protect us and look after us and that we're actually related to, right? So what what's the discernment there? And they're watching us too. And they're very interested in how this all goes down. I've been told that this is the greatest show in, in our universe right now. Mm -hmm. There are many species who just want to watch, who just are just fascinated with this period of ascension. Because really, Earth humans, we're, we're at this precipice where we can uh, shake this yoke of oppression and move on to a golden age, or we get locked down and, and oppressed like our Orwell's worst nightmare. Yeah. So the, there are a lot of, of these ETs that just want to see how this plays out. But then there's some who will intercede in a very subtle way. And whether it be through telepathy and communicating with people that are open to that, or, um, well, for example, I'm reading, uh, Barbara Masiniak's Bringers of the Dawn, which is Pleiadian mm -hmm. messaging. Great book written back in the 80s. Boy, still so relevant today and given such a great history of the earth and where we're at and, where, and the potential of joining these benevolent mm -hmm. uh, people, entities, once again, at a galactic table and, and, and rejoining with them. But right now, this is a very dangerous planet. Uh, they they look down at at what's going on here with all the wars and famine. We can't even feed our own people every night. One fifth are going to bed starving. Nuclear technology. So it's like the Planet of the Apes. Yeah, yeah. just questioning all the technology that we could use to make this a better world. Yes, and they're just quite uh, fascinated with this dilemma that we're in. In fact, it's even called Earth's dilemma, and it's the humans either rising above and being able to uh, resist this coming neo-fascist agenda, or um, we're going to go into a very dark place. And I don't know if I want to be reborn here on this planet anymore if mm -hmm. uh, it goes that way. 
I feel yeah. you. Oh my goodness. <laughs> what big shoulders we had to take this on. It is. Oh yeah. But we volunteered for this mission, Debbie, yeah. you know. But we did, it, but because we we're bringing the light also, you yeah. know, that's our job. You're bringing the wisdom, the information. I shine the light on people like you and so forth. And, and it, it's the jobs we play are important, right? Uh, for the, the spiritual and enlightened and aware community. And okay, so you took us a little bit into that when you were talking about this panel that you moderated and that that you're going to moderate. And that sounds really interesting this alien event what about the secret space program is there new information on that and where do we go from here <laughs> what's possible boy what's not possible i think is a better way to frame it because really we could be living in our star trek future yeah just keep in mind that gene rodbury who invented star trek it was humans who was doing the exploration of planet Earth. Yeah, Spock and other aliens factored in, but it was always humans that were doing the exploring of the universe for scientific and, and reasons that they want to do. Gene Rodbury was getting channeled messages mm -hmm. in the 1950s when he was being inspired to write the screenplays for Star Trek. He was sitting in on the Council of Nine in Los Angeles, and they were famously telepathically communicating with Earth humans from our future. Mm. And they were basically telling what this Star Trek future was going to be like. And of course, you have to be a peaceful society to be able to travel in such a way, especially through wormholes and so forth. I was reading in a great magazine out of Australia called Nexus Magazine about um, the early trials of our our own astronauts to go through wormholes and basically use some of this backward engineered technology to try to travel these long distances in a short period of time, doing a shortcut around the speed of light. And this Nexus Magazine article is saying that these craft could physically get up to nine tenths the speed of light. And that is the point when your physical body basically turns into energy and all that you have to guide this ship. And this is what they're trying to train their astronauts to do was your consciousness. Mm -hmm. So if your mind knows the roadmap and knows where to go, that you can go through these wormholes and boom, just right out in Alpha Centauri, very short time later. But the problem that they were having with these astronauts in this training is that they were not of a Buddha mind. They were not of an enlightened state. So they still had fear and anger or hatred, training and basic training or being involved in a war and perhaps having to kill someone. And, and so the, the craft would get up to the gate, right to the entrance of the wormhole when they were entering the stage of pure consciousness and just bouncing right back. They couldn't do it because the astronauts were not trained properly. The astronauts were not like these other ETs that can do it that are so much more advanced than we are. So this is what I'm saying with the superhuman abilities. This is the potential of the human race to start learning all this stuff. I mean, wouldn't it have been great if, say, in kindergarten, we started learning about the energy chakras in our body and First grade, we Absolutely. started using telepathy. By third grade, we're bending spoons mm -hmm. with telekinesis. And fifth grade, we're astral traveling together to other planets. So we're just not being given the information we need mm -hmm. to be able to utilize this incredible potential within all of us. Mm -hmm. Wow. One of the things, you know, in your bio is this 26-day expedition through the frozen land of Antarctica that you went on so bravely and you were going there in search of extraterrestrial craft and also remains of ancient civilizations how did that turn out for you were there anomalous structures that didn't appear to be naturally formed that you found well so yeah i went down there for it was a 26 day expedition 15 full days in antarctica along the northern tip of the palmer peninsula it's basically where uh, South America comes down and the 
Palmer Peninsula sticks up. It's the shortest distance from any continent to go to us, uh, Antarctica. So, um, yeah, I went down there with a litany of different subjects that I wanted to look into and, and possibly discover. You got to just understand that Antarctica is a huge continent. It's the fifth largest of the world. So the distances are very vast. It's over 99% covered in ice. So everything you need, you got to bring in with you. So that makes travel there very expensive, especially to try to go overland and say, check out the pyramid sites in the Shackleton range. I know where all these locations are. I've seen them on Google Earth and many of them are shown, which is quite the paradox because other locations, and I show this in my presentation called the Hidden Anomalies of Antarctica, they just put a Photoshop screen, this big white rectangle and don't even attempt to use a Photoshop tool to uh, mask the surroundings. There's no, nope, you're just not seeing what's here. Uh, so there, there is something being hidden down there. And that's probably some of these subjects that I was looking into massive hole in the ice to pyramids or antediluvian civilization, as well as giant mothership craft like Lester Holtz reporting on NBC nightly news, but trapped in the ice of Antarctica. And supposedly there are three massive craft. They're so big. They're over three miles across not in diameter, but across. And they've been known about since the 1970s and our intelligence agencies nicknamed them the Nina Pinta and Santa Maria. And I have been able to locate one of those that was being uh, unearthed in the year 2013. For some reason, Google Earth was allowing this to be seen. And you can go in the Wayback Machine and look at 2013 the Conan base, K-O-N-H-E-N, and I give the GPS coordinates in my talk, and there you see some kind of excavation of some massive type of craft underway. Now, if you go there, it's like they put up a, a circus tent. It's just sort of a whole bunch of poles where the ice is and wind have wind swept over. But in 2013, they're digging something out, and uh, th this has been known about for quite some time. In fact, I would even venture to say that the Nazis went to New Schwabenland and claimed this particular area because they saw this craft under the ice. And I just love it when I can get uh, connecting data points. And in this case, the Farsight Institute, which are remote viewers that can pick a target or use a GPS location and just go there, travel there with their minds. And they went into this craft and said, oh, it's massive. It was built for very, very tall, giant-like uh, entities. It's old. It's decrepit. It can't fly again. But it is this relic. It's one of the Nina Pinta and Santa Maria's. And so in an indirect way, I didn't get to go there. I would love to go there. Um, but in an indirect way, I've been discovering some of these hidden anomalies in Antarctica. Yes, and I'm aware of what you're referring to that um, during Nazi Germany, it, you know, I've followed a lot of that history that shows that they were using alien technology, they were building craft, they were going to use it, uh, and they were stopped, thankfully, in their tracks, and that there were things that were buried, there were caves formed in the ice there and uh, places where they were harboring all the craft and may, I'm sure scientists, et cetera, laboratories research. So the things that you discovered, Brad, was that beyond, way beyond the Germanic craft, that th these were also actually indigenous alien craft? Well, if you want to call indigenous of Earth being an alien craft, but they yeah, have been on yeah. quite some time, yeah. Yeah, and I would love to get out and see it. And I have an idea where the other two are, one of which is Linda Bolton Howe and her whistleblowers put it in the uh, Beardmore Glacier area, Spartan 1 and 2, and Brian S., who was doing flights to South Pole from uh, McMurdo Station. He also reported seeing the massive hole uh, under the ice, not too far away from the Amundsen-Scott Salt pole station 
Any uh, important secret agendas happening on the planet right now that we should be aware of that we would, should we know about them, want to escape their confines, want to wake up to our individual and our collective potential instead? Oh boy, <laughs> how many agendas are there? So many. Uh, the, the, there's just agenda after agenda because each extraterrestrial group has their own agenda too. And some of which are very dependent on Earth as a healthy living system. For example, there are some ETs that would come to Earth just to collect a, a rare beetle in the Amazon jungle. That's all they wanted to do. They just want to get the DNA out of there for some reason. It helps them. Uh, but uh, most are really concerned with what the Earthlings are going to do. So, for example, when we detonated our very first atomic bombs, that was a warning bell that rang throughout our universe. And a lot of extraterrestrials came here to see what was up. Wow. OK, they're like children that found a pack of matches in a very dry forest and they're lighting the matches and throwing them around how soon until a disaster strikes. Mm -hmm. So we're kind of right on the precipice, Debbie, uh, between being able to use our very, humans are very smart, clever people. We, we know what is right and what is wrong for the most part. And most of us want to see us ascend and go into this golden age. But there's others among us who are psychopaths that are doing all the the negative things that we hear about so much that are starting to come up. And it's good that we're hearing about this because it has been hidden in the shadows for so long and only by really exposing it and, and discussing the ramifications of what they've done for so long can we have a truth and reconciliation like South Africa did after apartheid and, and just move on. Um, that's what I hope we will see in the future is the mass arrests and rounding them up and giving people justice. And we can't be, we can't stoop down to their level and, and use uh, frontier justice and just hang them up from the tree, but give them their day in court and then let them sit in a jail cell for the rest of their lives and think about what they've done. Because we are all spirits in a human body and, and we'll come to that conclusion Science is already telling us this, but once the, the mass amount of people know this, then you're just going to be as good of a person as you can be because you realize when you do expire, it's not going to be St. Peter or God or anything else judging you. It's your own life review. It's you reviewing your life. And if you've done more good in the world than bad, then your circumstances will be better if you are to come back to earth or have a choice if you even want to be reborn here again. And all of that is contingent on what you do in this lifetime and being the best person you can be and being charitable and generous and helping people out, being in service to all. That is the distinguishing feature of many of these extraterrestrial groups. Some are in service to self and they have an agenda and they're the ones doing the abductions and the catamulations and things like that but most are in service to all, but they don't want to directly interfere with the earth. That would go against this prime directive that was also popularized in Star Trek, but it is a real universal law and that when you have an evolving civilization such as earth, uh, you got to let it evolve on its own. Let the free will people of the planet make their own decisions. Exactly. And that's where we find ourselves at right now. Mm -hmm. Planet of free will, humanity of free will. Absolutely. And what a huge lesson that is unto itself. I know, Brad, that people can find your books on your website, bradolson.com. Tell us where we can find you, what you're up to, what's next. Well, all that on bradolson.com. But if you wanted to check out the books, that's another website, cccpublishing.com. And if people order my books, then they go through my office here in Nevada and I can uh, send them out a signed copy. 
And where are you? You said you're going to be at this alien event. Where else can people see you and hear you? Yeah, and all my uh, conference schedules up on bradolson.com. So uh, alien event in the middle of September in Vegas. And then the very following weekend, uh, I'll be in Mount Shasta at the Light of Shasta conference. And then in October, I produce the How Weird Street Fair on October 14th. And the following weekend, I'm flying out to Orlando, Florida for the Galactic and Spiritual Informers Connection. Great big event with uh, Alex Collier, Michael Sala, Lena Denon, and quite a few other luminaries in the field. I'm very honored to be asked to speak there again. That's beautiful. Well, Brad, this is Dare to Dream. What are you next dare to dream? What are your future <laughs> dreams and goals? Well, gosh, Debbie, I'm I'm kind of kicking around the idea of taking off this winter, either going to Southeast Asia for a couple months. Love it there. Great part of the world. Uh, or maybe uh, driving down to Mexico for a couple of months. Um, but I got a ski pass, so might just stick around and ski. We'll see uh, if it's another monster ski season like it was last winter. Uh, that'd be worth sticking around for. But so I'm just developing a ranch that I bought out here in northwestern Nevada and and working on that. So I'm daring to dream that I'll put in a tiny home village and start doing uh, some conferences and small events, festivals on my own in a couple of oh. years time when, uh, when it builds out. So that's what I'm daring to dream. I love that. I love that. It truly is the time for that, for healing centers, for retreats, for places of community and gathering. I'm feeling the call for that myself very strongly. So mm. yeah, I send you lots of blessings on developing that land and making it into what you really want, what will serve you and whomever comes your way. Thank you so much for coming on the show and for all that you shared. It's beautiful to connect with you. Oh, well, thanks for having me on, Debbie. It was great to connect with you too. And next time you come to the conference and if I'm swarmed at my table just uh make your way through and i'll i'll grab you and take you behind the table and we'll get to hang Aww, out and talk. i would love that <laughs> i promise to do that next time i won't just look from afar because we do end up at a lot of the same events so that yeah. is a deal and again folks you can find him at brad olson o-l-s-e-n.com or cc publishing to get his books it is worth it i've read all the reviews they're phenomenal and I end today's show with this quote. Through journeys of travel and exploration, we unveil the spiritual tapestry of the esoteric unknown, finding that even in the depths of the universe's mysteries, we are the true UFOs, seeking the extraordinary within ourselves. Subscribe to this number one transformation conversation, the weekly Dare to Dream podcast with Debbie Dashinger, please leave a comment, share this, and you know I read them all and get back to you. Next week on the show, the guest is the amazing Dr. Brad Nelson, and we're going to be discussing one of his many books, The Energy Codes. Thank you folks for joining us today. And remember, don't just dare to dream, dare to turn all your dreams into your reality.